in it, we explain why democracy is both immoral and impractical. And, um, well, it, the book couldn't have come at a better time, now that many democracies suffer from enormous uh, social and economic problems. And uh, so let's see what kind of problems there are. Is there a... Um, a no, not a point. Uh, uh, ah, that's so much. Uh, after that, uh, oops, sorry. Well, after that, I will explain. Uh, I, will, I will show you some graph five uh, to indicate what problems democracies currently have on average, and that there's a cl clear trend in these problems uh, in the long term. And I will also explain why these uh, problems are inherent to the democratic model, why the uh, dynamics and principles of democracy lead to these problems, and. Uh, I will explain later on what the alternative would be and what ways we could be, uh, you know, follow to make democracy a bit more irrelevant. Oh, um, this is uh, the rise of government spending in modern, modern times. And as you can see, it has risen from about 10% in, uh, in, well, in 19 or 12% in 1913, 100 years ago, uh, to... 50%, and this is on average of the major Western democracies. So it's enormous, and this is also, of course, pretty much aligned with the tax rate. Of course, stifling innovation or productivity, etc. cetera. Um, what button? Is this sound? Or it doesn't seem to work. Maybe he w I, I pointed in the wrong direction. It doesn't seem to work, does it? Oh, oh now it does. Thank you. Uh, test, test. Oh, really? Could <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to... Um, um, this is the regulation. Grew 200-fold in the last... And this is the land of the free, uh, ex example, UK. In, in, in Europe, it's just as bad. Um, this is the tax law, but the Federal Code of Regulation is just as bad. It used to consist of one book, 100 years ago, and now it's 200 books. Uh, that's just one book for the index alone. Of course, uh, this is you know, uh, not ex exactly uh, motivating people to uh, innovate or start, countries, uh, start uh, companies. Uh, the growing welfare state, of course, again, an example of the United States, which is considered less of a welfare state than, for instance, the Netherlands. And that is true. So in Europe, this is worse. And this is only since 1983. And with Obamacare, this, of course, will expand even more. So uh, higher than 50%. Uh, the print, print, print. Uh, the money supply has grown enormously. A uh, dollar is only 2% worth or less uh, than it was uh, 100 years ago. Uh, in, in, well, again, a uh, democratic country uh, known for its freedom, blah, blah, blah. Um, but somehow these problems are never related to the democratic model itself, because um, it is. Um, oh, this is the last uh, graph that I would show you. I think this is a very interesting graph. I'm very glad that I found it, because it indicates that there's a real trend, uh, also again over all the um, uh, democratic countries, pretty much, of growth, you know, almost coming to a standstill, and. This I, I've, I've calculated the averages, and uh, in the 1960s it was on average 6.5 percent per year, and now it's 1.4. And as we all know now, if we have, uh, if in the Netherlands if we have 0 0.2, man, my God, we'll have a party. So um, we can see where this is leading to, and maybe this is the beginning of the end of the democratic model. I don't know. I, I don't like to make predictions, but. If this trend continues, we'll, we'll you know, be in serious problems. But as I said, um, people have still have faith in democracy. They don't relate problems to the democratic model itself. Um, it is a worldwide religion. I used to believe in it. Fifteen years ago, I was a great proponent of democracy. Uh, I didn't know much about it, actually nothing. I just believed the mantra. And I believe what the media, the educational system, the politicians told me that it was the best thing since sliced bread, the only alternative was a dictator, blah, blah, blah. 
And um, most people still believe that. And after studying it and scratching the surface, I came to a completely different idea. And, well, democracy is pretty much uh, above any criticism. Uh, the way I criticize it was really, you know, front, uh, you know, frontally and without holding prisoners. Uh, you, you're regarding as a, uh, you're regarded as an enemy of the state. Uh, well, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> but, um, so that's remarkable. And I think it's important to, well, demolish that, that stupid belief. Because I think democracy is a form of collectivism. And luckily, the experts agree. And one of the experts is uh, Karl Marx, who said the um, democracy is the road to socialism. And the Socialist Party of the United States said that uh, democracy and socialism are one and indivisible. And in my opinion, democracy is the idea that we can and often must decide on almost everything in society collectively. And there, uh, the decision that results from that process must be followed by everyone, also the people who are against it. It's one size fits all. And no money, no individual liberty, uh, no, no property is safe from majority rule. And just like as communism, fascism, the, um, the individual is subordinate to the wishes of the collective in a democracy. And it is socialism light. It is socialism through the back door, because you think you get uh, liberty, but you get socialism. And it is evolving into more socialism, more collectivism. And it suffers from the same problems, I think, as communism and fascism, but to a lower extent like corruption, centralization, loss of liberty, bureaucracy, economic stagnation. Uh, I'll, uh, well, for, if you want higher taxes, who have you voted actually during the last elections? Come on, don't be shy, you're amongst friends. Uh, I did on the Libertarian Party, but uh, very few actually, very good, very good. Um, well, quoted the disillusionment. What are the problems of democracy? Well, there are many, many, but I'll uh, limit it to a few. One of them is the built-in short-term outlook of the people who run it, uh, of the people actually also of the, not only the politicians, but also the, the voters, the citizens. Because um, politicians know that whatever they problems they create uh, through money printing or pension schemes that are too generous or whatever, um, they won't have to... Um, solve it. I mean, they will, uh, their successors will have to deal with the co negative consequences and they, can, and, and, uh, and, and they themselves can uh, deal with the positive consequences. So, but the successors have their, the, the same incentive, of course. Well, so let's kick the can down the road. And you can see that in the amount of debt accumulated by the US presidents. And this, was, uh, this is some older data, so you, we have to give Obama a bit more time. But he, he will catch up, he will catch up. Um, the second is that uh, it's, it's a system in which uh, everyone tries to live at the expense of others, which makes legal what was normally illegal. Um, and everybody, as you can see, I hope everyone can pretty more or less read this, but everyone wants free education or corporate, corporate subsidies uh, and want others to pay for that. It's a giant redistribution machine and not necessarily from the rich to the poor. And of course, this creates social tensions. And why? Because the winner takes all in a democracy. So that you can see that during the elections. Oh, yeah. The, the others, they are the enemy. Whereas in the market, you don't have that problem. People who decide differently are not your enemy. Another way, um, another thing with democracy is that it is not a very good way to either control or contain or direct government. Uh, they can pretty much do whatever they like sometimes, not, or not always, of course. But uh, as we can see with the bailout of the banks, uh, well, who was in favor of that? Very few. Uh, of course, there are lobby, lobby groups that have far more access to power than the average voter. I mean, most of the schemes he doesn't even know about. Well, there's so many laws. So, and uh, politicians never end up in jail for starting foreign wars on the false, pre false pretenses or uh, uh, printing money till high heaven, till no trees are left standing, 
or uh, breaking uh, election promises, no problem whatsoever. Uh, one of the most uh, persistent myths on democracy is that it is uh, equal to um, liberty. And that is, of course, wrong. Liberty is when you decide for yourself what to do and how to spend your money. And democracy is when the, demo uh, the, the, the majority, well, in theory, uh, decides how to do it. Um, of course, we can see during in our in daily lives that democracy didn't bring the liberty that we would like. I mean, uh, in America, you, you end up in jail, about a million people, I think, just for drug-related, uh, well, felonies. Um, another thing is that there's no freedom of contract, not in the Netherlands, between employer or employee, or doctor or patient, or uh, student or teacher. Uh, if you want to change something, a student would probably have to go to the capital and protest, and that's what they often do, to little avail, of course. And, of course, in the Netherlands, you have 50% of your income, well, on average, in the other democratic countries, too, that you have to spend on the government. Um, another thing is that um, it's very persistent myth that democracy equates prosperity. Well, this is not true. Actually, the reverse is true. We all know that uh, prosperity is a result of economic freedom and low taxes, little regulation but it has nothing to do with democracy. Uh, democracy is actually, you know, uh, the reverse, because it is like going out for dinner with 100 people and deciding up front that the bill will be split evenly. Of course, everyone have, has a very strong incentive to order that $10 dessert, and you will only pay 10 cents. This is called the tragedy of the commons, and everyone has this incentive, so the final bill will be much higher than anyone would like, but unfortunately, no one could do anything about it. So what's the alternative? Um, well, people expect me to come up with a model like, oh, we want, I, I will say there should be the three organizations there, and then blah, 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 and they have, uh, the, they have these responsibilities and uh, balance and checks in there. I don't have that, and I don't need to have that. I just have a model, much better. I will explain that more later. Um, so the alternative to uh, majority rule is self-rule. And the alternative to voting with your pencil is to vote with your feet, like we do in the market. And we, don't, we know actually that democracy is not the ideal thing, because we don't use it for everything. Uh, we don't use it in science, we don't use it in companies generally, and we don't use it to do our groceries, luckily. And so why should we use it to buy our health care or well, get health care or education? We could do that ourselves. And for that, we need decentralization to the level of the country in, uh, uh, when we speak about the EU or uh, the level of the province or the, the municipality or the individual. And we need, therefore, uh, you know, secessionist movement. Um, people say to me, well, and, and politicians, you know, say that too, we can't decentralize. We, sh we should centralize with the EU and stuff. That's very important because we have to form an economic block against the uh, Americans or against the Chinese. But there are countries, and Switzerland is one example, that is no part of the, one of these blocks and is doing very well. But Switzerland is an interesting country on its own too because it's internally, domestically, it's very decentralized as we all know now. It has 26 cantons, on average 250,000 people, and they have a, a rather a lot of autonomy on healthcare, taxes, and education. Uh, I, I've heard that it's under threat more and more. But still, this is nothing. This is a lot compared to what the Dutch provinces have. They don't have any tools to compete with others in that regard. It also has 2,600 um, municipalities, smallest 35 people, I've heard. So, and of course, I must admit, uh, there is no more democratic country than, <laughs> than Switzerland. So you would say, well, we need more democracy. But I don't think so. I think the result of Switzerland lies not so much in its direct democracy, but 
in its decentralized system. So therefore, we need, uh, well, we, have, we need secession. We need more countries. We only have 200 countries in for 7 billion people in the world. That is not a market for governance, that is, or for government services. That is more like a cartel. And therefore, we need secession, because uh, secession is the safety valve against big government, just as the right to start a company is the safety valve against monopolies and uh, cartels in the free market. Well, in the free market, yeah. Um, and an example of administrative secession, where you just become, you know, stay part of the country itself, but get more autonomy, uh, is Jura, which is French and Catholic, and in 1980 it was still part. Till 1980, it was still part of the Canton of Bern. Uh, which was German-speaking and Protestant, if I'm right. And so, uh, secession is, an, uh, is, an, is a way of bringing back social peace, because there were was, was some tensions arising, and, well, uh, it was done very peacefully and orderly. Um, another an, a thing I, interesting thing I learned from Liechtenstein, uh, a country that is by some uh, some accounts more uh, prosperous or successful than Switzerland itself, is that it consists only of uh, 35,000 inhabitants and 11 municipi municipalities, and they all have the right to secede, remarkably. <laughs> so, um, can you imagine? I mean, it's almost like a, a small village that can secede and form a country. But still, Monaco is two square kilometers, so why not? Um, so I think it's uh, very important that we promote this idea of secession. And I think there are more examples, of course, Czechoslovakia and North and South Sudan. But this is a, a nice example too, not far from here. So um, I think we need a market for governance, for governmental uh, services. We need governmental service providers. And for that we need you know, let a thousand nations bloom, or even more. We need... Um, so how would that uh, play out? I think, of course, there would, there would be countries that cater to religious people, or to eco-hippies, or conservatives, or, or, you know, capitalists, libertarians, whatever. And they would all compete for companies and people to come there. And um, they d do not have to be democratically uh, managed or ruled. It could be anything in between authoritarian rule and uh, dem full democracy. And of course, in companies, we can see that the people who have a vote in the board are the people who, who uh, you know, pay shares or bought shares, uh, paid into it, uh, who. Uh, you know, have special merits or special positions. And it's not just uh, one man, one vote. It can be a kaleidoscope of different influences uh, by different people. And of course, they, they would probably, if there would be enough small countries in the world, they would offer you a clear-cut contract. You say, well, you have to, you're going to pay this much for, for so many years. These are the rules. And people can, you know, change things through the democratic model in the same country, but to say, no, 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 I have a contract. None of you, and uh, certainly I don't, uh, has a contract with their government stating what to pay for how long and what to get in return. But, you know, I think if there were many countries like these, we would have more, uh, so, uh, more uh, legal certainty regarding this. Well, most people think that such a thing could not happen because we need. Um, am I over time? Oh. How many? Yeah. Okay. Um, don't we need a s central government or a central organization to or uh, organize this? And I don't think so. We we have examples of spontaneous order, and one of them is the internet on the right, and. 
when I first was introduced to the internet in 1993, uh, my immediate question was, oh, who owns this? <laughs> because before that, you had uh, companies like America Online who had their own networks. And I couldn't believe there was something like that that could just arise out of spontaneous order. And I think the same applies to the market for governance. And of course, you believe in spontaneous order for the free market. So why not for the market for governance? So we need startup countries. And uh, well, you could say that Singapore was a startup country. And Dubai is a very good example, too, I think. They're not ideal, but uh, the, you know they compete, which is good. More competition is better. Um, left is Shenzhen. And of course, it can be a special economic zone like Shenzhen. Uh, another thing is the charter cities. Currently, or lately, they tried to start one in Honduras. Unfortunately, it didn't succeed. But the idea still lives on. So that's good. Another example is by uh, Petri Friedman, Seastead. It might, say, uh, it might sound a bit you know, too far off, but uh, these, uh, these are islands, floating islands in the sea, and they're very stable. And they can grow bigger, and they can deflate the, you know, the, the, the balloon of big governments, in a way. So this is not, of course, the only example, but it is an example. So we, have, we would have the contractual society, like I said, I think more than we do now. You have no legal certainty in a democracy. Uh, what was uh, illegal yesterday can be legal tomorrow. I don't know, they say, well, we're going to give you pension uh, when you get older, you paid for it. And they say, oh, I'm sorry, you're older now. No money, no cigar for you. So that's bad. So small is beautiful. Of the 20 most prosperous states in the world, 15 are lower, uh, smaller than 8 million people. Um, Liechtenstein, I think it's a, it's a fantastic country. I sent my book to uh, Hans, Prince Hans, uh, Prince Adam, Hans Adam the Zweite. Uh, he sent me a nice letter back. I hope he will read it. So the conclusion is that if you want more freedom, don't look at democracy. Um, if, you, if you think the democratic process will lead to more freedom, I think it's a distraction. Uh, I'm not against libertarian parties, but don't think you'll get ever the majority or something. There's something inherent into democracy in the model that <laughs> we will never find a libertarian system. Um, so we need to promote the idea of secession. I think that's much better. Uh, and that can be in, in various ways, administrative secession, like free zones, or uh, provinces with more autonomy, or complete secession. Um, is, that, is that a viable option? And I think, well, you know, it's, it's difficult to say, but there are reasons to be cheerful, to reasons to be optimistic, because technology is a great democratizer, but in a good way, more than democracy itself, because it empowers the individual. And we could see that with iPhones, with the internet. Uh, people are, you know, the, the, the poorest person in the world can start a web shop or uh, start a Facebook page. And people can organize in, in such ways. So this is a bottom-up approach that is, you know, now through the internet, very well possible. And people empower themselves. People notice that they can sequence their own DNA. They can say, oh, I'm a master of my own health, in a way. I don't need government in a or I don't need a doctor, maybe. And hopefully this trend will continue to governmental issues too. And then we'll have more, more countries, and more secession. And we'll have a market for governance. And we can vote with our feet. And I think that is a good thing. Thank you. <laughs>